Buenos días a todos. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here once again as part of this webinar cycle. Today, we will be having an Ask Me Anything session on uh, modeling sophisticated architectures and mission critical systems. The dynamics will be as usual. First, we will introduce our speakers, then they will give a brief presentation on the topic. And finally, we will have the usual Q&A session for which please do open your microphones, turn your cameras and ask the questions you, yourselves. So without further ado, I'm handing the microphone over to our speaker. So Gonzalo, the floor is all yours. Hello, good afternoon. My name is Gonzalo Echawe. I will be talking about how to build systems with the complex architectures that are usually mission critical. Uh, we also have Armin, Gonzalo Galotti, and also Pablo and Gustavo. And they will also be telling us a bit about uh, the issue and answering any questions that you may have. At the beginning, I will give an overview on uh, the topic that is recorded for this event that precisely talks about this issue. And after the summary, we will move on to the Q&A session. Okay, so when we are building mission critical systems, usually what we do is we start working with the design systems. It doesn't matter if it's a large system uh, from the beginning or not, but we're going to create a knowledge base and then we will start defining the objects that will integrate the system and then we will build applications right these applications may be one or more than one and therefore we may be talking about one or more kbs usually that system is monolithical we usually do deployment in a database but as the complexity increases or we have different requirements that system can change or vary depending on this monolithic structure. So you will have uh, more interoperability. You could have uh, macro microservices. And today we will uh, be talking a bit about the architecture that we can have in the Genexus knowledge base so that we can uh, work on those scenarios. Going from uh, uh, monolith to microservices, going through macro services and mini services, what we need to take into account is that we um, gain, when we go from monolith to microservices, we gain flexibility, agility, and also complexity as we move on from one to the other. We have one system that is a monolith. Uh, then if you move towards macro services or mini services, uh, you will increase flexibility and interoperability amongst them, uh, but you will be losing data consistency, the, your, your DC, because if it's a monolith, you know that everything can be worked on from a single place and all modifications will be uh, automated. But the further you move towards microservices, that consistency, at least you need to uh, consider it from another perspective. So we will see the different alternatives that we have uh, when building this knowledge base. An example when we are working with a monolith is that we will have a one knowledge base. Probably we will have one web app and one database. It doesn't matter what you have within it, right? You may have a web app or a mobile app or a chatbot, whatever. It doesn't matter which channels you will use to distribute the applications or through which these applications will be exposed to the users, uh, but it will matter how they are built. And this building process is usually uh, a deployment, a web app and one database. So you will have things like, for example, a single integration, Usually the design system will also be only one and it will not present any inconveniences. Now, when you change that for any reason, it may happen that you have one KB and an N number of web apps. So you will have N subsystems that will uh, probably have different deployment units, but all of them will be working on the same knowledge base or the data management is in one single place. 
here what we are gaining with this is that we can deploy on different web apps with different deployment units and when you update one of them you're not i don't want to say penalizing but you don't need to uh upload or download one single web app which is not going to cause any trouble in terms of having the uh, system up and running all the time how do you build this well you build it from the knowledge base you have n deployment units and your deployment units you will have uh, anything that is necessary to deploy to different web apps you will still have one knowledge base one database sorry so when you want to grow you need to take into account that that database needs to be hosted somewhere so that is something to consider and then you have another possibility in terms of uh how to build this because in this case you have one kb with n web apps and in this case you have n knowledge bases with n web apps and n databases so they are not joined they do not share tables these knowledge bases okay in this case the subsystems that you have are in different knowledge bases and for you to be able to access those data to be able to access from kb1 to kb2 and you need to work with those data one of the things that you need to do is uh, you will export the data views for example because you will have access from kb1 to the data model that you have in kb2 for instance so you can interact with those data it's important to know who is the data owner and you can have all the access and you can work using those data when you have exported transactions also what you can do is you can you can have all the uh, table that is extended and that will be made available in KB1 because you have the data module of KB1 plus uh, you know all the other KBs. An alternative to this is instead of exporting these transactions, what you can do in uh, this KB, you build a package module, you export it, and it's imported in KB1. What you have in this case is that you can have uh, the module with a procedure that will allow you to work on the data that are in uh, KBN, but what's going to happen is that you will not have uh, joins, so you cannot access the transactions that are defined in KBN because you have different modules but well it's an alternative and this would be the best of both worlds right you have a package you distribute it but you also distribute transactions so you create data views and kbs where you want to access to uh, all the subsystems that you have in different kbs you know that when you package modules you're uh, distributing uh, modules and binaries and those processes that are part of the modules interface will be accessible in kb1 and that could be for instance uh data updates uh from that or also considering that you have transactions available you can access all the tables that are in other kbs and work on those data but in none of these cases will you have tables that are duplicated or repeated tables in which you may have to uh, work on data replication in that case in the case in which you have two different uh, knowledge bases that have two subsystems but then have a table in common they share a table so in that case what you need to do is uh, more than ever before you need to know who the data owner is so that they are the ones that update the data. And one of the mechanisms that you can use in this case is, let's assume that the data owner of a uh, customer table is uh, KB1. When you modify any piece of data, uh, in a way, it will update the datum that is in uh, KBN. But that process, which is a synchronous process, may fail. You may need to be certain that it's powerful enough so that it will not be recorded n times the same datum. And that means that you need to be especially careful. Another mechanism that you may also use when you have this sort of data replication is 
instead of updating synchronously all the data that are replicated in a table in another knowledge base, what you can do is you, you may use um, The data owner uh, will record the datum with a special topic and anyone that is uh, subscribed to that topic will see that the datum has changed and it will be updated. That is probably the safest mechanism uh, if, then, if you want to deal with data consistency, of course. And related to all this uh, architecture mechanism, whenever you're migrating from uh, monolith KBs to uh, KBs that may be hosted in a mini services or microservices environment, it's important to bear in mind that we incorporated the API object that will allow us to have uh, micro dataways that will have a layer within them. What we recommend is from now on, instead of exposing one procedure or uh, several procedures as web services, we recommend you to create the API object and that API object will have all the processes that you want to expose, uh, all the APIs that you want to expose for a particular object, they will be together. So let's say that you have a client and you want to have the, the client's list uh, and or you want to modify a client's name or you know the invoice for a client just to name an example then those should be processes that are called from the api object and the client's api object would would expose all the methods that are conceptually uh working on the same entity and the good thing is that what you expose is the api object and no longer the procedures implemented that, that, that implemented the method called by the API object, which is very good and very important for a number of reasons. First of all, because when you, ex because you will have the mediation layer that will allow you with before and after events uh, to, for example, handle all the, manage all the parameters that will be passed to the object that is implementing the process itself. And what that allows you to do is to uh, manage this in a more efficient way. Our recommendation now for you is to use the API object as the mechanism to expose the API when you're creating your systems. Okay, anyway, so that was a bit of what we had as a, as an, uh, as a brief summary of the talk. Okay, if that was the summary then, now we are moving on to the Q&A session. Uh, so to our attendees, our dear audience, please feel free to ask any questions to our speakers. Let's take advantage of having people like Armin here. And we have Gonzalo as well. We have Gonzalo Galotti. We have Pablo as well. And also Gustavo, so we have a first class team for you to ask any questions that you may want to ask. Okay, so here I have a question that I got on the chat. So I will read it to you. According to your experience in uh, the development and deployment of applications in a 1KB scenario with multiple deployment units, the deployment units for the different environments, what is the recommendation? GX server? Okay, who's going to answer that? Yeah, I can go. Go ahead, Armin. Okay, so the deployment is done with the information that is in an object that is called deployment unit in a knowledge base. So in this deployment unit object, you can declare which objects will be deployed. Then the deployment process 
and the maintenance of environments for these deployments is done with the information that is available in environments and in versions. Versions allow you to get different uh, development lines and the environments in these development lines will declare different environments. So for example, we may have a Java environment or a .NET environment and you have different production versions, production lines, sorry. So you may have a version that goes in production, then you have another production line that is building the following version. All these objects or parts of a knowledge base that I mentioned can be declared in a knowledge base. And the central repository of this knowledge will be saved in GX server. Yes. So in that case, GX server will be the one that will keep uh, the different uh, knowledge of the different production lines and the different deployment units that are, well, of course, GX server is the one that you should be using for, for each of these projects as the central repository or the repository that will have all the information uh, with which you will get the deployment process going. Yeah. Maybe I'd like to add something, if you don't mind. When we are working with a corporate knowledge base where you have a number of developers, you don't have any other option other than use uh, GX server. You need to have the work skin copies of uh, for each of your developers and work with this centralized uh, repository. And with this centralized repository, you will define all the pipelines in which, uh, yes, you will do part of that deployment process. So the, the process itself is much more complex than that. But what you do is uh, you deploy somewhere ultimately. And I think it's really important to mention that whenever you're building your knowledge bases that are mission critical, it's really important for developers when you're working in your modules for you to uh, build your corresponding unit tests so that they can be tested by the developer. And then when uh, they are committed, and when you go through in, in GX server, you go through the, the pipeline process, it's really important to include these uh, GX tests to avoid uh, any testing issues. Okay, Gonza, um, two things, please. Can you please stop sharing? Thank you. And then uh, when you when you speak, if you can get a little bit closer to the mic, that would be lovely. Thank you. Okay, I have here a question by uh, Christian Setacharze that says, is there a, a good practice manual for um, to, to learn how to migrate a big project? Okay, that's a good question, actually. Um, to migrate large projects. Would this be for the migration of GX uh, Genexus versions? Because if so, you have a documentation that we always uh, have associated to each Genexus version. Uh, there is macro information of what things are to be taken into account when you want to convert a knowledge base into a newer Genexus version. So, Imagine that you're working, I don't know, in Java with Genexus 15 and you want to migrate to Java and uh, so you, you, will, you will keep the environment the same, but you want to work with Genexus 17 or the last upgrade. Um, then in our release notes, you will have some information available of what things need to be taken into account and which steps you should take uh, throughout this migration process. This involves how to manage the Genexus server instances how to work with uh, knowledge bases and how to manage them in these instances, and uh, also what steps to take to uh, get to the new environment and what tests or what things you should consider in terms of compatibility, uh, for instance, and how to take advantage of the new uh, good stuff that you'll find in the new version. And then, yeah, usually any compatibility issue to be considered. On top of that, uh, it also includes good testing practices that could be both um, through testing artifacts that are available in Genexus, but also through tools that will allow you in a way to, or will help you, let's say, uh, 
to identify if everything is going to keep on running the same or better or how it will keep on working with, for instance, uh, browsing comparative tools. You will also find tools in this sense. So in this case, I would go along the lines of release notes. I think that that's, that's the place where you will find the best information. Then if you're talking about systems migrations um, of things that, I don't know, maybe, you know, with a Windows interface, something a bit older, and you want to migrate them to uh, the web, then you will also find information not only in our wiki, but also um, the ones with the best experience in the sense is anyone that has provided services. Uh, with different companies or different partners of ours that have provided migration services and that have vast experience in this regard. So much of this knowledge that these companies have and that are willing to share that, uh, that knowledge uh, can be found in videos uh, and presentations where they shared their experiences and their knowledge to the community uh, as part of Genexus's events. So depending on what kind of migration you're dealing with or you're planning, uh, I could provide you with uh, different links to different uh, source materials, uh, audiovisual materials usually, and also documentation, or maybe one on to refer you to some partners that can help you in this migration process. Okay, we have Cesar, thank you. We have Cesar that says it would be great to have a microservices example with an own base, with, a, with your own base and with a crossed update. Gonza, maybe you want to answer that? Gonzalo. Gonzalo? Yeah, that is a bit of the scenario that Gonzalo told us about. So if you have uh, microservices and a KB, uh, I don't know, I don't really know if in this question you're talking about uh, one single KB or different KBs, because if it's a single KB, uh, then an example could be, uh, well, it's simpler, you know, because you can directly access from the very same KB uh, to the tables. But if you have two different KBs, two different knowledge bases, uh, to run a cross update, you will have to uh, incorporate the uh, all the data views transactions. So depending on whether you're talking about independent KBs or not, it's the solution that you will have to, to go for. But I think that if, if we're talking about examples, it's usually about, you know, having services and using data views as well. Yeah, and you could also uh, have the module exposing a procedure for it to be updated. Why not? But yeah, probably the best thing, in, in my opinion, is what Gonzalo said, right? If you're working with different knowledge bases, you need to uh, include services. And if, if you're working with... a the same KV, KBs, then you can access through transactions with your data views. Cesar is asking us, in these cases, I, uh, in these last couple of days, I worked with the migration of my KB from GX17 upgrade five to upgrade six, and had a strong uh, problem to overcome with the uh, SAC hashtag 50459. What do you recommend in this case? Go back to U5 or go to U7? Or what is more recommended? Have two different environments pointing at the same database? And wouldn't this be affecting my GAM? Um, todavía no leí cuál es el, el SAC específico. Okay. Uh, no, 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 no. no, no. I, I still don't know which is the specific SAC. So, uh, I haven't read the technical content of that uh, SAC in particular, but usually the advancements uh, made by GAM are always backwards compatible. So that means that you will have a database that will be shared between uh, web apps. Uh, I'm talking about, of course, a GAM database. Uh, where a web app stays in U5 and the other one moves to U7 or U6. 
Uh, and the same applies for the identity provider. If the gamma integration is done through an identity provider, then that identity provider could be in one version. And the applications in another. Well, in this specific case, uh, Paulo said that there is a hot fix for the yeah, upgrade six. So you, you could maybe download that hot fix and you don't necessarily need to uh, do everything manually. Okay, I have a question by Rodrigo. When we are developing in a 1KB scenario where eventually you will deploy a number of development units, should I be using modules? Uh, sorry, the use of modules, how does that benefit us? Okay, using modules is recommended by us because it will uh, give you benefits later on when, for example, you want to separate uh, in different KBs, then modules are going to make it much easier to separate uh, KBs per module and then to working with the module packaging. Uh, that is first. You know, and then, because I'm, I, I like to be tidy, so I like to have my modules created and, and that makes it easier for you to work with them in a more tidy way. So in particular, when you're gonna, if you ever have the scenario which you have to divide and to split that KB in different KBs, then modules will be fundamental because you will know which module to take to each KB. Uh, and that makes the packaging much faster and much easier. Armin? See, si. Armin, maybe you want to add something? Yeah, yeah, that's that's good. It's a different conceptual separation. Uh, deployment units are a preview of how you want to um, separate the system and deploy the system. And modules are a logical separation for my systems modules. And it's a way of organizing my knowledge. This knowledge organization, uh, apart from a, a better organization, will also provide you with the advantages that Gonzalo was saying, when you want to grow and you want to split, in logical modules later on, uh, when you want to share knowledge, for instance, and so on and so forth, that's going to make it much easier. And it will also uh, help you in terms of methodological aspects, because of, for example, how you structure your teams. Sometimes you have different people that are working on the development of different modules or are experts uh, when, when things scale up, they are experts in one of these knowledge-based modules. And so each of them will be working in their modules. Uh, some teams work like that. You have a developer that's working in, in their own module. And this modularization, in a way, helps you to clearly delineate the different uh, members' responsibilities. Who's going to touch what? Uh, Definition de, de, or maybe you know we could we could uh, lay the foundations for later on uh, to define who is the data owner, for instance. Uh, but uh, from starters, it helps it helps you to share knowledge and to modularize the knowledge base. So definitely better conceptualization. That is uh, from day one. Cesar Giuliani is asking us to uh, ask a question. So go ahead, Cesar, please. Hello. Good afternoon. How are you? I wanted to ask you the following question. Let's assume that I'm working with a monolith KB with uh, different microservices, you know, several microservices divided in modules per functionality, according to functionality. And with each of these functionalities or features, uh, each microservice with their associated deployment units. And I want to integrate that with uh, Jenkins. Una modificación. And whenever there is a modification to any object that affects a deployment unit, I would like the pipeline to uh, run full for that deployment unit, but not for the others. So basically to be able to, you know, maybe one object is affecting more than one deployment unit. So I would like to, uh, through Jenkins, or through Jenkins uh, pipelines to say, okay, wait a second here, you have uh, two different deployments that you will need to 
move towards uh, QA or what, whatever environment and not all these others because there were no changes made to all the others. How do you detect that? ¿Cómo lo podrías hacer hoy? Um... Okay, so how, how can you do that today? Mm, let me think. I think... Uh, I'm, I'm really wondering about this because I think that you would need to uh, do things a bit artificially. So I'd like to detect that case and then directly, you know, uh, avoid compiling. Well, as you said, not 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 making uh, progress with a pipeline that, that, that is unnecessary. So today in Genexus, you could have a build per deployment unit. So by each deployment unit, but you don't know whether or not you need to uh, build in another deployment unit uh, or not. So to know that, that information is in the specs because you have inferences on which object uh, to generate that uh, exist not at a knowledge base uh, level, but in terms of the information collected by the specification process. So for example, if you have a change in an attribute, you could, uh, you know, the specifier could detect that uh, which which product programs need to be regenerated or maybe it's not necessary to regenerate them and this is information that the specifier has it it's not necessarily in the knowledge base so you need to have uh, this build all uh, anyway you will have to do it and from there you will need to infer whether or not you need to uh, change some other stuff to infer whether or not you um, you need to make these advancements then if you didn't, uh, it would depend on whether or not the sources associated to that deployment unit have been modified. It's a very complex issue because you don't have that high level abstraction. Uh, so you would need to, you know, compare files, at least, I don't know, another way to overcome this. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, uh, I've been, you know, modeling this over and I was thinking about, you know, advancing all the corresponding pipelines and then comparing the, uh, you know, dot .zip or dot .war that was uh, created with the previous one. And if there are no changes, then I don't uh, load it to the server. Yeah, you do everything, you do all the pipeline, you just don't deploy it, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I don't know if anyone, uh, present here in this webinar has also, uh, we have people with great experience. Maybe someone has gone through the same as you, uh, Cesar. Uh, I don't know if you need to compare the the, the, the the end hard files or what to do, but I think you're, you're, you're on the right track. We're thinking about stuff like that as a matter of fact. We are thinking about how to improve it. Even, you know, the, the opposite example, if you want to just deploy one deployment unit, but maybe uh, if you need to update another deployment unit, because otherwise it will be uh, recording uh, non-valid data in tables that you are consulting. Uh, so sometimes it's it's not so dangerous to, well, you know, you know, both things could happen. Maybe you don't want to update uh, one of them, but you realize that you need to update it because otherwise you will be recording non-valid data. So yeah, it could, that could also happen. Much of the progress that we've made in the last year is that uh, you will be able to configure in the knowledge base uh, that you don't want the build process to advance, or at least that you get an alert, especially when, you, when you're talking about the impact process, whenever you have reorganizations that are not backwards compatible. Because when you're in that scenario, uh, you know that maybe methodologically you don't do that kind of organization, uh, reorganization, but if someone does it uh, by accident, then the impact process will detect it. And then you will know that you can either reorganize it or uh, actually you will have to deploy all deployment units at once because if you have incompatibility in your deployment units and your old deployment units, now they will stop working. So in that step, uh, we made some progress, but regarding what you said, we, we still don't have a very clear way of uh, how to detect it. Any other question by the audience? 
Yes, can I? Yeah, of course, Luis, go ahead. Hello, everyone. There are many cases in which, for example, I need to uh, work with a query to different web services, one after the other. Is there any way in which I can make, uh, I can call all of them at once and for them to be like waitlisted or queued? So let me get this straight. You have a web panel that needs to call different web services and you want uh, you want them all to be asynchronous or synchronous uh, to follow them? Okay, uh, I wasn't clear. Let me give an example. I have an SD application where I do uh, login. After I log in, I needed to uh, I needed to, for example, find invoices or balances, so I need to call three or four processes. And then I, 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 I do one and I have to wait and I have a second one and I have to wait. So my question is if I can uh, do it asynchronously and simultaneously. That, that, is, that is usually the case for web apps, you know, not so much for SD apps. So what you want to do is you can do a submit for each of them. Yes, because um, what happens now is this. Um, I have an application that is uh, done in Genexus entirely, and I have a customer that is consuming our APIs, but it's, for example, uh, done in, in, in Flutter. So their login time is much faster than ours because if they need to consume three APIs, it will you know, consume the login, and then you will have to consume two more. So the response time uh, usually the, the login time needs to be faster. So that is also, uh, you know, passed for web applications. For instance, a, a person needs to take a picture of the document, and so it's consuming different services, uh, third party services that will uh, for example, work with uh, FaceMet and uh, document verification and so on. And that usually takes a bit longer. So I need to wait for one uh, until it returns and then go to the other and then to the other. So for me, it would be much better uh, to work with a thread, for example. So what we do nowadays is we develop, uh, we developed another API that works uh, with uh, networks and the times are much uh, faster, you know, the response time is much faster. So I don't know if there is a way to work with this in our applications. Yeah, Luis, I think that what you're asking us is actually that the uh, Ford can be in parallel and that you can run different uh, Genexus products, right? That is not something that is ready yet. It's part of our roadmap to uh, be able to improve different threads simultaneously in your applications. But there is a way that, as Gonzalo was telling you, uh, works, that is, when you submit the uh, procedures. If you submit the three procedures, then maybe as a parameter, you pass an ID for it to uh, later obtain uh, or identify the result. And then, you know, with your cache or with your session or even within the database, you can have different flags or specific flags that will monitor that when they are done, you know, of course it's, yeah, no, I understand that. This is a possibility. Uh, we agree that maybe if we had a four command and you could work in parallel using all the thread, it would be even better, much better. But yeah, nowadays the mechanism that you have available is the submit. If you want to have different processes running simultaneously, procedures running simultaneously, uh, you work with uh, the, the command to use is submit. Yeah, Luis, another thing, maybe it would be great for you uh, uh, to define a callback, right? So that it calls something that 
when that procedure is done, maybe it lets you know uh, that you can go ahead. Maybe that's what's uh, making you get stuck, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I know how to work with this submit uh, example that you gave me, but the things that I need to uh, do everything manually, uh, when, you know, if I have a, a DLL uh, with less than 20 lines, you can do everything and you don't need to control it or to record a table or save a table, you know. Uh, yeah, precisely. So maybe if you had the uh, callback to get the control again, when it's done, uh, that would be great for you, wouldn't it? Yeah, definitely. Sometimes I have to select a table and if I'm, you know, working with an Azure uh, WS uh, table, I need to pay much more because I'm going to be reading the table and that involves costs. So um, what we did was a first version like that and then we changed and we developed a DLL that we call it and it execute, it runs the threads. And so there is a, a uh, there is an SPU cost, but you don't have the cost of having to save and read a table. This was the first version that we worked with and we, we changed it. Okay, yeah, let's, uh, we take a note of what you said and we will do some further research. Yeah, can I ask something else? Yeah, sure, go ahead. Oh, yeah. In the, uh, for example, it happens to, to me that if I'm working with a video, it works with a generator, but if I do an F5, it doesn't. It will only work with the specifications first. And when that is done, then only will it uh, start with object generation. I don't know if that is a bug that, or it should be like that uh, for F5. I don't know which version uh, you're working with, uh, which Nexus version you're working with. Upgrade 6. Upgrade 6. Okay, no, it should have that already. If you had some objects to be generated for some reason, uh, they should be uh, generated in parallel already. Uh, the only thing is that you need to specify the first object so that you uh, get the generators up. You know, that's a decision that we made when we started with generation and specification, that specification processes are uh, are the first thing that is done. And then once you specify the first object, oh, it's done uh, on demand. So if you have a case that is specifying a number of objects and it's not generating, then I would tell you that, that is a bug, definitely. And then we should, uh, we should take a look at that case in particular and see why that's happening. Uh, there are some cases in which you have to wait a bit before you generate the object because you need to uh, save uh, some information like a cross-reference or some very specific examples, but except, I mean, unless you're working in that uh, case, if this is something that is commonly happening, it should be a bug. So maybe we need to take a look at that. Yeah, what I've um, observed is that when I, when I, do uh, when I make a number of uh, changes and I'm gonna, you know, do a specification with F5, uh, I do it exclusively with a specification. Uh, it, it's done exclusively with specifications, and once that is done, you then the generators uh, start working. Well, no, it shouldn't be like that. That that should be that that must be about. And we have to see if we can reproduce your scenario some somehow. Yeah, I will try to keep on working with it and try to see if there is anything weird. I'll try to take a further look. Yeah, another thing is, I don't know if it's possible to configure it so that first, uh, let's say my computer is uh, has a 16 core and I wanted to uh, execute, to run 32 specific cater threads and then 32 generator threads. Is, is that possible? because it's it's very difficult to define the number of specifiers and the number of generators uh, to make better performance, you know, because what happens in my case is that I have uh, KBs that are exclusive of Genexus. I have some K, uh, I have some knowledge bases that are like KB tools, 
and I have some uh, other KBs. And depending on which I'm working with, I need to change it because uh, each of them will give a different performance. Some will take much longer in the specifier part and some others in the generator part. So uh, imagine that I have 20 specifiers. When that is done, then it only starts generating. Only then it starts generating, I mean. Yeah, maybe we maybe we know that it's not dynamic, but you know, the idea that you can say uh, the number of, uh, that you can move from specifier to generator dynamically, that, that is great because maybe today you want to overdimension it and you have many more uh, specifiers or uh, generators than, than, than the number of cores that you have, but that is going to eat up your, uh, your computer, right? It's going to be uh, just uh, very busy specifying and generating, and it will not allow you to keep on working doing other stuff. So maybe what we need to do is go back on this uh, issue of how to go from so many cores to specifying when there is nothing else for it to be specified and just to let it uh, start using cores so that it generates. So yeah, uh, we're also taking note of that to take a look, okay? It's an idea that we already had considered, but we haven't worked on it. Yeah, because depending on the knowledge basis, you will have some uh, heavier specification processes and some others, the generation processes will be a bit heavier. So it's not something automatic that you can just say, I'm gonna allocate this much to the specifier and this much to the generator, because sometimes it's better to give more cores to the specifying process and it will make it go faster. Yes, and when you change the number of generators and specifiers, maybe that, that it wouldn't be necessary to uh, close Genexus and open it again, because if you change it, you need to close it and open it uh, for it to, let's say, uh, start working with a new configuration. Yeah, yeah, we're also working on that. Thank you, Luis. Any other questions by the audience? Yes, good afternoon. Okay, so uh, this thing that Luis and Pablo were talking about, Gustavo, I can't, I, sorry, I couldn't remember your name. I, think, uh, I know nothing about that. So maybe, you know, I would like to take a look at that conversation that you guys were having. Is there any link that you can uh, give me in terms of specification? Because, uh, you know, I bumped into the case in which I had a KB in, you know, after, in which after doing the specification, uh, it just uh, got stuck in the first specification instances. And in my case, you can maybe spend three, four minutes without doing a thing. And then, you know, the specification starts uh, working. So uh, I don't know if you can give me any more information about this. Thank you. Yeah, Jorge, definitely I have some links to share with you with information of concurrent processes and some uh, SACs that talked about these processes and these, these issues that were reported and corrected. Okay, yeah, that's great, Pablo, thank you. Okay, yeah, Pablo has just uh, copied the link on the chat, okay? Yeah, thank you, that's great, lovely. Can, can, I, can I just make a comment on Jorge's question? What I'm using for uh, Genexus um, KBs and with the KB tools is that for each three specifiers, you have uh, twice as many generators. And that works for me. That works really well. What happens is that when you are done with the specification, with a little bit more of time, you will have the generation. For the uh, work with the plus, uh, that doesn't work because the process takes longer. So you need to define that half is for specification and half for generation. Because up to 50 or 60% of the objects uh, take much longer to be specified than generator and, and then it stops happening, it, it, it works well. So these are the two configurations that have helped me the, the best, you know, the most in, in this situation.
Thank you, Luis. Thanks. Okay, any other question? I have one question here by Virginia. Is there any definition or recommendation of when to uh, work with uh, microservices? When to do a microservice? Okay, that, that depends. When Gonzalo showed in, in his slides that there is this uh, progression uh, that goes, you know, from monolith to mini services and microservices, or maybe, you know, the other way around, and each of them will give you their own advantages and disadvantages. So depending on what you're looking for, it's better to uh, do a microservice or not. Uh, the more microservices you have, the more administration you will need to have. You will have uh, some more issues in terms of the, uh, what's, what's the name again? I'm oh, sorry, you know, I have it in the tip of my tongue. Yeah, what was that? Yeah, and when you, the further you move towards a monolith structure, you, you're working with a, a standardized non-replication database. So database, uh, data are always consistent. I, I meant data consistency specifically. Yeah, but there is no recipe, is there? Uh, a recipe that tells you do microservices when you have a KB or a module with an N definition. Uh, we don't have a recipe for that. There is no specification in that sense. I mean, you you can see some examples of when microservices have, have been used. Uh, for example, we used it for uh, the vaccination system in Uruguay, and we have documentation for that case, but maybe in another case, in a different case, it's not necessary to work with a microservice. Yeah, and that also depends a lot on the, on the size of your team, right? If you have uh, just a few developers, uh, chances are very high that a microservice structure will maybe, you know, be uh, do more damage than good. So uh, usually you work with microservices when you want to, let's say, have very separated uh, functionalities with very differentiated teams in what they do, and they have different deployment pipelines, for instance. Uh, so the life cycle of a module is much shorter than some others. And in that case, you do want to have microservices because it will allow you to deploy, to deploy uh, each module independently. That, that you, well, you can't do it in a monolith structure because you have to do everything uh, together at once. So if you have a very separated, isolated team with different responsibilities, then yeah, maybe a microservice structure will be uh, the best idea. But if it's if it's a much smaller, more, more cohesive team that maybe you know wants to keep things uh, simple and you don't need that much observability because that is something that is uh, given to you by microservices. Uh, then you need to measure a lot of things. And as Gonzalo said, we don't have a clear recipe in terms of which uh, approach to use. Usually, uh, you know, it boils down to the configuration of your team and the speed uh, at which each, each team needs to work with each functionality. That is what will define at the end of the, at the, end of the day whether you work or not with microservices. Okay, very good. We have another question by Jaime here. Uh, for authentication and automation, do you always recommend using GAM? Yes. With GAM, you can model the security model that you want. If you want authentication, uh, roles, permits, uh, everything is modeled there. And then a lot of things will be, the, the, the running time will be uh, configured. You know, you will configure roles and different um, authentication methods. And that is gonna, you know, save a lot of work, but in terms of security, specifically speaking, uh, the greatest security that you will have in your generated applications is when you're using GAM. From a technical standpoint, um, 
they they call instructions to verify security even before the start event uh, starts you know or if there is an authentication or authorization error the uh, when it comes to not allowing someone to keep on moving forward that response uh, well you will get it with uh, you will get it in due time and fashion with the associated error code and these are all advantages that are given by gam these are things that are run even before anything else that you could be programming in a stable event great okay i have one last question oh well i have another one here on the chat okay ricardo is not a question he's just confirming what you said i have gerardo here asking me in the case of using event-based to authenticate data can you uh do it uh completely from genexus yeah even bus is a way to communicate for example microservices it's a more sophisticated way let's say in which communication is asynchronous instead of synchronous uh, so we have a message in an event bus that could be you know a kafka or you can do it on azure or on the cloud that also have their integrated event bus and you can integrate it and have another deployment uh, another genexus uh, service that is monitoring that that uh, event in particular so in genexus uh, you can work with a uh, kafka there is an api that allows you to produce and consume data in a kafka type event pass you can publish it uh, you can publish uh, publish these events in this system We've also been working with uh, Azure's 11 ba event bus, and soon we will be working with Amazon technologies such as Kinesis and even Rich. Uh, we will also be working with that very soon. But yeah, basically that's it. Okay, very good. We have time for one more question. If anyone has another question, one last question. Okay, so, yeah. No, yeah. Uh, uh, there was there was one thing that I, that you know got me thinking uh, of that first question that we we got. I can't remember who asked it. Chris, you know, I think it was. He asked us about how to uh, migrate. You know, and we were just discussing uh, between each other how uh, if you were talking about migration in terms of how to move from one architecture to another and you have everything in one knowledge base and you want to separate the code in multiple knowledge bases and if that is the case we have some experiences uh based on some projects where the first thing that you do is you modularize the knowledge base so if you want to if you have a kb and you do a monolithic deployment and you want to move to multiple kbs then you have on the one hand modules on the other hand deployment units uh, these will be the first objects that you will use and you will start modularizing your kb and then you will try to remove let's say the module that that is the most isolated of all depending on the system the one that is uh, least coupled with all the others and that works uh, more isolatedly these would be the first steps to be taken the first of them would be uh, always uh, more modularization and then identifying which is that module and then you start separating that in a different uh, knowledge base you decide how to run that other module if you go in a different web app or a different deployment unit uh, and then after the monolith the first thing that you will have is two web apps and you will need uh, users to move from one web app to another. And that is uh, generally done following the Google model. So you have a Gmail uh, web app, another Gmail uh, that is Google Docs, and a third one that is the identity provider. And that will allow you to have a single sign-on uh, to move from one to the other without having to log in again. So that is probably uh, 
a good migration process if by migration you you re, you were referring to that kind of migration yeah um christian said that it was him indeed who asked the question and that was really interested in knowing more about this but yeah but basically what armin said creating modules and working with uh, modules whenever we work with a large project and we've been working on a couple with armin for example with the coronavirus and the application we started with a monolith kb and we started working with modules from day one because we knew that sooner or later that was going to be important uh modules and deployment units that would be let's say the very first definition of what you need to do uh to get to the architecture in your kb uh, of uh to, to work as many services you have a number of deployment units that are all pointing towards one single uh knowledge base okay guys we've run out of time thank you very much so just a couple of comments First of all, last Thursday, the 16th, is going to be our last Ask Me Anything session. It's going to be about the 2022 roadmap. We're going to have Armin, Eugenio, and Jose that will be telling us a bit about this. So get your questions ready beforehand. And secondly, as you know, if you've uh, attended our webinars, remember that all our forums, all our Genexus forums, uh, that we were using before are just on read-only mode and they have been migrated to Stack Overflow. So if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to uh, do that on Stack Overflow, which is where everything is happening. That is all I have to say for now. And we'll see you next uh, Thursday. Thank you for coming. Thank you for joining. See you around. Bye-bye.